Good morning. This is Mark Wilson, director of the Caroline Marshall Drawn Center for the Arts and Humanities in the College of Liberal Arts at Auburn University. Thanks for joining us for this live presentation from Pebble Hill, the historic Scott Yarborough House in Auburn. Life is not normal right now, and we're not sure how long this challenging moment will last. Stories from the past can instruct and inspire, and we are joined by Professor Emeritus, historian, writer, and chief storyteller, Dr. Wayne Flint. Following Dr. Flint's presentation, we will have time for some questions, and you can enter your question in the comment box. Dr. Flint. Thank you, Mark. Um, in a sense, I feel like uh, I'm so old, I was here at the beginning of the Yarborough House, but that was uh, before the Civil War, so I don't date back quite that far, but I do date back uh, to the time when this became the Center for the Humanities and Outreach at Auburn University. And so I'm honored to be back and to talk with you. Harry Cruz, one of the great fiction writers produced by the South, uh, actually from South Georgia, once wrote that nothing is ever lost to memory among a storytelling people. And whether that was on your back porch or your front porch when you were growing up and it was a grandparent or even a great grandparent, or whether that is a more technologically sophisticated medium of sharing stories such as we have today. One thing is constant. That is, we come from a people, black and white in Alabama, who were storytellers. And so what I want to do today is to make a sort of broad philosophical point that is rooted in the study of history and then three very specific anecdotal stories, not just about Alabama in three critical periods of history, but about my own family in those three periods of history. The broad conceptual idea here is that we have sometimes assumed that what is normal for us is routine, where we can go to the store, the doctor, the dentist, uh, the hairdresser, the barbershop, whenever we want to. And that's true that most of our lives navigate through a pattern, a journey that is normal. But the one I want to emphasize today is that in almost every generation that I can think of, that I've studied in Alabama history, there's been a crisis. And I don't mean just a casual crisis, just a crisis for a family or um, a particular group of people living in North Alabama or South Alabama. I mean a crisis in the sense that people will not survive that crisis, either physically or perhaps morally or intellectually, and be the same people they were when the crisis began. Think, for instance, uh, in Purvin Proud, a story I tell about a family, a very poor family, walking all the way from South Carolina to Calhoun County, Alabama, in the northeastern part of the state uh, where my family lived. And at about the same time, my family lived there. And they write home uh, to relatives in South Carolina about trying to cut down the large hardwood forest so that they could carve out a small farm for the little babies and the older children who came with them walking from South Carolina. And the head of that family, a man writes back, uh, this man in his 30s, to his relatives in South Carolina. And he says, I don't know how life will be for us, but what I know that for any of us who live a little while, life will be better. And the crisis of that family then morphs into the Civil War and then Reconstruction and then the great influenza epidemic of 1918-1919, First World War. Uh, all of that basically uh, explained in the correspondence of that family over a period of nearly a century. So whether it's the journey of discovery or whether it's the Civil War, or whether it's the First World War and the influenza epidemic, or whether it's the Great Depression, or whether it's the Second World War, whether it's the Civil Rights Movement, you can see that for any family that lived in Alabama for any length of time at all, 
there was a great crisis. And so what I want to do is to tell you briefly about three crises and working from the premise of Harry Cruz that uh, among the storytelling people, nothing is ever forgotten. I want to uh, put this in the context of my own family. And so let's go back in time to poor white sharecropping people in North Alabama uh, at Goose Bend. And Goose Bend was a mountain at a bend in the Coosa River between Gadsden and Anniston. And that land now cannot even be accessed because it was part of the Pelham Artillery Range during the Second World War. And they fired so many artillery rounds and dropped so many bombs in the, into that area from Goose Bend to Anniston that now the only time you can get access to the cemetery where my people are buried is on one day a year, one weekend a year, uh, Memorial Day weekend, when they open the road, but you can't get off the road because if you get off the road, you will probably be killed by a piece of unexploded artillery shells. So I've gone back to that cemetery and I've read the grave markers and I've put together the story of their lives. In the case of my grandfather, he came from a plantation family of well-to-do, uh, seven surgeons in the family who served the Confederate Army during the Civil War. Uh, he was born just after the war ended when the schools were closed. He never got a chance to go to school and he grew up unable to read or write. He married a woman who was one of 18 children. Uh, her father uh, ran the ferry across the Coosa River from <laughs> St. Clair County to Calhoun County. And uh, she was, according to my storytelling, uh, Aunt Little May, uh, the tenth child in the first batch, as if they were biscuits coming out of the oven. Uh, her mother died in childbirth with the tenth child, my grandfather, who had ten children, uh, all under 13 years of age, and therefore unable to take care of them, married again, and had eight more children. So my grandmother, Annie, was one of 18 children. My grandfather from a very large family. My grandfather, not able to read and write, <clears throat> was a sharecropper sharing, uh, farming someone else's land, uh, all in that area that is now part of the Pelham Range in northwestern Calhoun County. Uh, my dad grew up on that farm and deciding that he did not want to spend the rest of his life looking at the backside of a mule plowing land and growing cotton, decided very quickly in life that he wanted to get off the land and go someplace else. However, he was a rising senior at Ohatchee High School with a <clears throat> legend of personal health tragedies. When he was a young boy, a young teenager, he was chopping wood on the farm and an ax blade bounced off the chopping block and cut a deep gash in his leg. His family, not able to access medical care in an area where there was no doctor and they had no money, did what generations of poor white and black families did at the time. They decided to use folk remedies. In this case, it was turpentine and alcohol, some other mixture to deal with the gash in his leg. Unfortunately, it failed. And my father developed osteomyelitis, which is bone disease, which causes the bone to die and little chips of the bone will break off from the ball and navigate their way through the skin all the way to the surface. You can imagine the excruciating pain of having that happen week after week after week after week. As a result, my father was out of high school, in fact, entirely for two years while his mother tried to uh, reduce the uh, anxiety of his life and the severity of his pain. Uh, he was finally able to go back to school uh, and was able to earn enough money on the side helping farmers to buy an Ohatchee class graduation ring. But by this time, he was a strapping six foot two uh, muscular young student, two years older than anyone else in his class. And typically of Alabama at the time, uh, schools were so underfunded that all of the students in his senior class had to sit two to a seat. So you slid into a seat and you slid all the way to the side where the arm was, and then an arm would reach around the, the seat. 
and he and his best friend were sitting and because two of them were sitting in the same desk like everyone else in the class my father's legs were bent to the outside toward the entry to the room when his very young teacher not much older than he was came in the door tripped over his feet was outraged and told him to get out of the, get out of this uh, class uh, he immediately responded by getting up and getting out of the class and then he opened the door to the school and went out and sat on the steps. Uh, after the class was over, the teacher started looking for him, couldn't find him, uh, finally located him outside the school, sitting on the steps, and she had him expelled because he had disobeyed her. He had left the class but gone outside the school, which was a violation of school rules. Dad tried to explain that he had not, that she had not told him to go, not to go outside the, the school, she had told him to get out of the room, which he had literally done. Uh, so my father, a proud man whose pride had been hurt by this public display, uh, dropped out of school, uh, left Shady Glen, Ohatchee, headed to Birmingham, and for nine months, from 1937 to 1938, he stood outside Virginia Bridge Company with a sign asking the recruitment people to hire him for a job at a steel mill. Every morning, sometimes around the fire in the wintertime, uh, long lines of men queuing up in front of Virginia Bridge to get a job as a steel worker. After nine months, the magical day came as uh, the World War spread in Europe and the TVA uh, was begun by Franklin Roosevelt and Virginia Bridge was building the gates on the Tennessee Valley dams. And so dad was finally asked to come out and to take a job as a steel worker. At that point, he was uh, courting my mother. Uh, Mom was a brilliant student. Uh, she was the valedictorian of her class at Jefferson County High School, but came from a family uh, whose head was uh, an alcoholic and with all sorts of problems of poverty, rheumatic fever, scarlet fever, as a young woman, a young girl, uh, which plagued her for the rest of her life. Uh, instead of going to college, my mother eloped the day after she was valedictorian at Jefferson County's graduation. Uh, did not start college until my first year as a professor at Howard College, where she, my mother then enrolled, now Sanford University, as a freshman. I was a freshman prof the first time my 42-year-old mother was a freshman student at Howard College, Sanford University. Uh, the story of her life was a story not unlike the story of my father in that with scarlet fever, and rheumatic fever, and all sorts of health problems when she became pregnant uh, with my sister. Uh, she had uh, difficulty with the pregnancy and uh, just as she went into labor, suddenly the fetus stopped kicking and the birth revealed that my sister was stillborn. Uh, the doctor uh, presiding uh, in Trussell at that time told her not to get pregnant again, that with a history of rheumatic and scarlet fever, if she, got, if she became pregnant again, she would almost certainly die. Uh, mother immediately and purposefully became pregnant again <laughs> because she was determined to have a baby. And um, uh, on October 4th, 1940 in Pontotoc, Mississippi, as she was wheeled into delivery, uh, she told the doctor that if it was a choice between her life or the baby's life, uh, he should save the baby. The story of this conflated uh, marriage, this uh, difficult story, uh, both in terms of economic deprivation and in terms of personal anxiety and help, is fairly typical of every single person who's ever lived in this state. Your crisis can be national, can be even international, it can be a pandemic, it can be bad choices, it can be a variety of things, but the point is uh, almost everybody has a crisis. And the story of life is not whether or not you have a crisis, but it's how you navigate the crisis. 
Mother and dad together made a wonderful life. Dad is a salesman, despite the fact that he never had a high school diploma. Uh, and then in the Second World War, uh, another crisis of quite a different kind. Dad was selling various things. Uh, he was selling burial policies for Liberty National Insurance Company. He was selling uh, sunshine biscuit crackers and cookies. Uh, he was selling meat for Swift and Company meat packers. Uh, he was a brilliant storyteller and a brilliant salesman. On uh, Early in the war, <clears throat> he was uh, forced to go back to uh, what is now UAB Hospital in Birmingham, where a famous surgeon by the name of Cheryl uh, did surgery on his legs and was able to save his legs, but only at the cost of six months of rehabilitation. During that time, my mother who at the time didn't even know how to drive a car, much less do accounting, got a job at um, the Anderson Ordnance Depot, uh, which uh, was able to provide an income for them while my dad was recovering. But when dad recovered, uh, he discovered that in 1943, as he was trying to sell house to house, his charm and his good looks and his incredible ability to market a product and tell you things about the product that might or might not be entirely true, but certainly were persuasive. My father discovered that fewer and fewer people were buying his product. And finally, one, one woman who had been a faithful customer for a long time confronted him dramatically at her door saying, I'm not buying anything from you. What's a tall, strong, muscular man like you doing still at home selling crackers door to door when my husband is in uh, Europe fighting for freedom and the possibility of dying for freedom. And dad suddenly realized the reason no one was ordering is because everyone he was calling on was now a woman who had a son or a grandson or a husband who was off in the Pacific or European theater of war. So dad went home and told mom that he was going to volunteer for the U.S. Army and she begged him not to do it because she had a, a three-year-old son now by him and who would take care of them. And dad said, well, they're not going to take me anyway. So dad went to Fort McPherson, Georgia for a physical for the U.S. Army and predictably the Army took one look at the scars on his legs from his knee to his ankle and the uh, recurrence of osteomyelitis, which caused bone to uh, break off and gravitate to his leg. And understanding that they had more than enough for surgeons to do than to take care of someone like him, they turned him down. And so dad's story was not the story of combat, not the story of being a hero overseas. Uh, his was a story of what happens in a family crisis when nobody is buying your product because they misunderstand why you're even available at the time you're available. Very different story. And then finally, there's my story. Um, integrate myself into this story, now grown up from October 4th, 1940, into a 24-year-old new PhD at Howard College, my alma mater, uh, about to be christened Sanford University. And one of the things I did when I arrived in 1965, having been uh, college chairman of uh, Alabama for uh, Nixon Lodge as a Republican, the first Republican in my family in 1960, and now having been one over to the Civil Rights Movement and to the Johnson administration, I organized a tutoring program at Rosedale High School made up of the Baptist Student Union the Student Education Association and a new organization I formed called the Young Democrats at Sanford. And that group of students from a variety of backgrounds, religious idealism, uh, desire to change the world, political activism, uh, tutored at Rosedale, which was a ghetto inside of Homewood. Uh, middle class, uh, most of the men who worked there worked at the steel mills in Inslee or Fairfield. Uh, many of them had uh, pretty good educations. Uh, all of them were ambitious for their children and their children's futures. And so every uh, once a week uh, on Wednesday afternoons, uh, I would take my large group of students and we would go over and we would tutor. Uh, Rosedale High School was within a mile or two of Shades Valley High School, 
which was the high school that at that time served Mountain Brook, Vestavia Hills, what is now Hoover, the southern part of Jefferson County, and it was considered one of the two best high schools in Alabama. Uh, Sidney Lanier in Montgomery had the highest ranking in terms of national merit finalists, but Shades Valley was very close to it. In this wonderful high school, two miles away from Rosedale, uh, they regularly had students who went to Harvard and Princeton and Yale and, and elite colleges all over America. But in Rosedale, the high school had no microscope. It did not have a chemistry class, a physics class, or a foreign language class. What it did have was young African-American children who had been emboldened by their parents who were now members of the United Steelworkers, who were making a decent living, who were flourishing in their lives in this Homewood ghetto, to dream a dream beyond the crises of their ordinary lives. And so we divided the students between those who were very slow learners who had no skills at all, uh, those who wanted to learn Spanish or French or German and could be tutored by one of our students from Sanford. And my job was to take those who were college bound, who dreamed of a world quite beyond the world of their parents in many ways, the way I had dreamed of a world quite beyond the world of my parents. And the possibilities of how do you get there? What's the process of getting there, especially when you have no foreign languages, no microscopes, no chemistry programs, no physics programs. And among the students that I tutored during that period of years was a young woman by the name of Elizabeth Sloan. Elizabeth's father was a steel worker at U.S. Steel in Fairfield. Uh, he was hardworking, dependable, uh, morally upright, straight, stable family. Uh, as it turned out, her mother, though we did not know it at the time, was in the early stages of cancer. Elizabeth, who was a sort of stoical, quiet, thoughtful young woman, uh, a little bit, I thought at first, intimidated by me. Uh, but as I found out, when she became my student at Sanford University, actually just a very quiet, uh, uh, introspective student who never had much to say about anything, but who was extremely ambitious and uh, an excellent student at Rosedale. When we uh, had our first African-American students admitted to Sanford in 1969, uh, the first co-ed who was admitted to Sanford was Elizabeth Sloan, the student from Rosedale, only a few minutes away, and yet in so many ways a world away. With Shades Valley High School, one of the best high schools in the state, only two miles away, but for white students only and with multiple languages and chemistry and physics and microscopes for virtually every student. Uh, and then in the ghetto at Rosedale, uh, a family of hardworking, thoughtful, upwardly mobile people. Elizabeth was one of the best students I ever had right up until the time in an upper level class in American intellectual history, she failed an exam. And when um, she didn't volunteer to come in to explain what happened to her, uh, I cornered her at a class one day and said, Elizabeth, what in the world happened to you on this exam? And without tears, and with a kind of stoical fatalism that was typical of her, she said, my mother is dying of cancer. And in fact, the first time I ever went to the funeral ceremony for uh, an African-American was for Elizabeth's mother. Uh, I retested her. She made an A on the exam retest. She went on to graduate with honors at Sanford University. Uh, then she became, uh, since she was a speech uh, and theater major, she became uh, the um, re reporter on the largest uh, TV station, Birmingham, Alabama. Then was hired by Alabama um, A&M University in Huntsville uh, to head their uh, um, educational television segment, a director of that program at uh, her death, tragically, several years ago. That is the story of one person and the way in which, in which the crises of her lives were institutional and not because of something she or her family did. 
As a part of that tutoring program, we also followed up with a registration drive after the passage of the Voting Rights Act of 1969. And one of the persons that I carried to register to vote was a 90 plus year old woman, African American, who had never voted in her life because of the restrictions on voting. And when I took her in 1968 to vote in her first presidential election, the Homewood District where she was uh, scheduled to vote. Uh, I walked with her in a long line to the front. There were almost no blacks in the line. And when we arrived at the registrar's office, the office where you sign your name and they check your photo ID. Number one, she did not have a driver's license. Number two, she did not know how to read or write and could not sign her name. Uh, the clerk there said, well, you can't vote. You have no driver's license and you cannot sign your name. And I said, well, that's not true. In 1965, the Voting Rights Act provided four cases like this because of systematic injustice in Alabama and apartheid. And in fact, she can vote, but I'll have to go into the booth with her and tell her the names on the of, of, of machine so that she can pull the lever, but, but I'll have to read it to her. And she said, well, that's not allowed under Alabama law. And I said, I know that, but uh, the Federal Voting Rights Act of 1965 trumps Alabama law. Uh, we had quite a confrontation and that uh, delayed everybody behind us until finally she said, if you don't leave this voting precinct, I'm gonna have the Homewood police arrest you. Uh, to which I responded in some anger, and there are voting registrars all across the state of Alabama today, ensuring that the 1965 Voting Rights Act will be enforced. And I'm going to call them as soon as I'm allowed to from the Homewood Jail, and I can guarantee you I will be out of the Homewood Jail before you're out of a federal penitentiary for denying a federally guaranteed right to this woman. At that point, there were all sorts of murmurs coming from the back of the line from dozens of people who were waiting to vote, not happy about me or the 90 plus year old woman. However, uh, one of the proudest moments of my life was walking into that voting booth and reading the names of the people on the ballot and that woman casting her first vote for president of the United States. Crises come in strange ways, personal ways, the ways that we choose to live our lives, the epochs in which we were born and the epochs in which we grew up and the epochs of our old age. The one thing for certain is there will always be a crisis. Dr. Flint, you will not be surprised that many of your former students are online watching, and we've had as many as 137 people uh, watching at any one time thus far. Got a great question from Steve Murray, former student, now director of the Alabama Department of Archives and History. And as Steve is known, he doesn't propose easy questions. So here's the question. When a crisis develops during a time of political polarization, what determines whether a society comes together in unity or further divides in animosity? You know, we may be uh, charting new ground here, Steve. Uh, uh, I wouldn't want to be plowing this furrow uh, in 2020. Because the one thing that tends to happen in any crisis is that whatever differences people have uh, along class or racial lines. And here I think particularly of the Great Depression, where uh, the difference between an African-American sharecropper and a white sharecropper like my grandfather was very small. <laughs> and uh, what you had in common was a feeling that the New Deal uh, and Franklin Roosevelt were going to put in place uh, policies that would make life better for you. Uh, the one thing that I find uh, that is uh, wonderful about a crisis is that it pushes aside some of the old cleavages in a society. And in particular, I think this is possible with what we've experienced now. Uh, the villains in this story, depending upon how you view it, is either Donald Trump or it's the Democrats. It's either the liberals or the conservatives. Uh, it's kind of interesting that the virus that is now infecting America 
really is not Democratic or Republican. <laughs> it is absolutely neutral. Therefore, the question is not which side was responsible for getting us in this mess. It really doesn't make much difference. Uh, the question is, how do we get out of this mess? And what is likely to happen is that there will be two sets of answers to that. One set of answers will be more this way or that way. And then what we'll have to do is to try the, the way that is this and the way that is that. And one of those two will be successful and one of those two will not. So for instance, if, you're, if your option is that the administration failed completely from the federal standpoint to prepare adequately after the 18th of January when the first virus was discovered in Seattle, Washington. And then here we are in late March uh, trying to figure out if we have enough mask and uh, surgical gear and test kits in order to adequately uh, test people who come down with the virus or may be symptomatic. Uh, the question is, how do you decide whether the administration should be blamed for not responding quicker than they did? I would just point out that the first case in China was November 17th, and the Chinese government covered that up and did not respond until the end of December, six weeks later. And I would point out that if you take the first discovery of test results in Seattle uh, from January 18th, then here we are in late March trying to decide why we don't have enough masks, why we don't have enough surgical uh, cover. Uh, that's one way in which people are gonna be processing this. That is, who is to blame for the fact that eight weeks after the first report in Seattle on January 18th, we still don't have enough test kits to know how many cases we have. So do you blame the administration? Or on the other hand, do you blame those who are criticizing the administration when what we need to do is pull together? What we need to do is have a harmonious Congress that does whatever the federal leadership says. So does federal leadership in this case fail? Has federalism failed? Has the Food and Drug Administration failed because they didn't approve the local laboratory test in Washington uh, State in Seattle that was done at the University of Washington and was available until uh, the Food and Drug Administration chose to approve it on March 2nd. March 2nd, they approved what had been available in February from a laboratory at the University of Washington. That is a massive federal failure. Now, who is responsible for that failure? You can say, well, it's the American political bureaucracy. Or maybe you can blame President Trump because President Trump's initial response was to say, well, by tulip and daffodil time, uh, the weather will warm and we won't have any problem. Or, well, we have one case uh, from Seattle, but on the other hand, by tomorrow morning, we probably won't have any cases. I hear I'm pretty much quoting directly from what the president said. So is the president to be blamed and held responsible because the president uh, basically uh, was Pollyanna during what was in fact uh, hell happening in America? Or are the Democrats to blame because they're in their, bipart in their partisanship, they're preventing some sort of common coming together to ratchet up all the programs that are available? Uh, frankly, uh, that's, gonna be, that's gonna be answered not by political affiliation but by your personal experience with what goes on. Uh, if your grandmom or granddaddy comes down with the, uh, the virus, uh, the question of who's responsible is gonna be answered in a very different way as if your family's not touched by it. Well, and that leads to another question because um, as you have written, written in several books, uh, the religious faith of Alabamians is important to us personal, personally and collectively. And so uh, your friend Mark Gray has a question related to uh, our faith and how does our faith um, help us respond in a crisis like this. So I'd like to, to broaden the question in terms of the crises in Alabama history 
uh, what was the role of faith and faith communities and how does that inform how faith communities might act now? That's a great question. I would expect something that's sophisticated from Martin Gray. Uh, in many ways, the founder of the Cooperative Baptist Fellowship in the state. Uh, I would say this, that uh, there is a wonderful uh, theological concept called the providence of God. And the question is, does God preordain uh, in Calvinistic fashion everything that's going to happen in the world? And if God preordains everything, then what's the role of free will? Uh, how do we choose our own fate rather than for God to predetermine that fate? So part of this is a, a much larger and much more complex theological debate about the role of Calvinism, which we really don't have time to, <laughs> to fully discuss here. But what I would say that at the back of almost every rational person's mind is what I call the practical version of the providence of God. That is, when you run out of space, when you run out of room, when you run out of explanations, when you run out of scientific uh, discoveries, when you run out of doctors' uh, prognoses and doctors' uh, uh, recommendations for what you ought to do, you're simply left in a, in a place where you realize there's an awful lot of stuff that we don't control even the smartest of us, even the most brilliant of us, even the most educated of us, even the PhDs among us, there's a place where um, uh, the virus really doesn't respect any of those things. And that's the ground at which I think we find the deepest meaning of a crisis of any kind, whether it's a crisis of settlement in the 1840s or war in the 1860s or a depression in the 1930s or, or war uh, again in Europe and Asia in the 1940s. That is, when you get to irreducible evil in the world or when you get to irreducible tragedy in the world of what is the providence of God in this story? Does God cause it or does God simply navigate us in a way that allows us to get through it and remind us of how small our greatest intelligence is? So from a theological perspective, morphing back to my Baptist preacher role, uh, I would say that the answer to that question is that God sees within events that happen to us a possibility of us working our way through a theology of what all this means. Well, there are some who would say, well, what God is doing is revealing what God wants to reveal about God. And what I would say is what God does is to open up to us all of the possible avenues by which we can deal with this. That is stoicism, fatalism, resignation, hope, a sense that our choices are really important to the outcome of our lives. So if we do foolish things like go to the beach and thousands on spring break from Auburn University. And then we come around, come down with uh, the virus. Uh, that's not God's plan for us. That is our stupidity. <laughs> and so to some degree, I see this in a sort of free will context of crises, which invite us to be partners with God. And the providence of God is oftentimes uh, not carried through because of the stupidity of human beings. But if we work with God, we can get through this. If we, if we choose to do stupid things and ignore God and pretend that there is no God, then I would say uh, we're left our own devices and that's kind of scary right now. Because if you look at Washington, D.C., and you think, uh, here is what we have to look forward to. <laughs> I just assume, believe in God and assume that there is a force in, in the universe beyond ourselves because I don't have much confidence in what's going on in Washington. Uh, Dr. Flint, you told stories from your family's history in the context of Alabama history because life has slowed down uh, so quickly for everyone and people find themselves in their home uh, being a little more reflective possibly than usual. 
um, and because there are so many uh, family history resources available to people online, um, if persons are interested in studying their family's history to understand how their family members responded to crises, uh, what are the questions that you hope people would ask? As a historian, um, what, what advice do you give persons who are delving into their uh, family history um, to look for similar stories? That's a terrific question. Uh, if, if, I can, if I can rephrase that question mark just a little bit, uh, historians and my students who studied history have really come, come, to, come to history in two directions, from two directions. One, one direction is from the general, the generalization to the particular. So what you're doing is you're looking at American history and crises, and then from that broad general perspective, you're looking at the particular family that is has the last name F-L-Y-N-T, not I, F-L-Y-N-T, my branch of the family. And so you're looking at everything through a prism of the general, and then the general defines the particular. Uh, I've spent my entire career writing history from the other direction. <laughs> uh, that is from my first research and my first writing in the 1960s. What I wanted to do was to find what was unique and particular in every single family. And because I was really put off by the notion that you write about presidents if you want to understand American politics. No, you, you write about sharecroppers like my grandfather who never voted and yet was considered to be a political leader within the community and they would gather on his front porch before every presidential election to ask my grandfather how he was going to vote. And my grandfather, who couldn't read and write, would tell them what he thought about Franklin Roosevelt and why you ought to vote for Franklin Roosevelt. That is a particular story about an uneducated man who was in fact very educated about politics because of the conversations and the programs that were designed in Washington, D.C. and talked about in Shady Glen, Alabama. So that for me, everything begins not at the top down, but at the bottom up. And that's the reason why I've written about sharecroppers and textile mill workers uh, in the Chattahoochee Valley and about uh, timber workers and lumber workers and coal miners and steel workers. Uh, it's because the building blocks of history are there. That's where you start off. That's where you build a foundation. And if you think of history as being processed by the particular, of course, the whole story of history changes. For instance, there are multimillionaires like, like Henry Ford and others uh, who didn't do badly at all during the Great Depression. <laughs> but of course, the Great Depression is not about people like Andrew Carnegie and, and Henry Ford uh, and Nelson Rockefeller. The, the story of the Depression is about of uh, people who were laid off work and, and the flotsam and jetsam blown away by the economy and the breakdown of the economy. I would say the same thing is happening in March of 2020. Uh, I, I get so put off by people who, who uh, turn on the TV and MSNBC or, or CNN every morning and look at the stock report. And then, and then the bifurcation of the story all day long is those who have just gotten the coronavirus and those who just lost everything or made everything or like uh, we just discovered this morning with Senator Burr, based on intelligence he was getting in federal reports, so millions of dollars worth of stock in order to miss the collapse of the stock market. Uh, if you're, if you're, if your life is controlled by the virus because you don't have resources, because you don't have $50, like half of Americans don't have, they don't have enough money to get through one week when the, when the great virus comes to America. And now the question is, uh, uh, who profited from this and who didn't profit from that? And so my view is, that it is not the general that controls the particular, but the particular that ought to control the general. And I think all the stories that are really important stories began in your family, with your people, with your background, and it's from that uh, primary evidence that you build the general story of American history.
Excellent, thank you. And now I have a question for everyone watching. Uh, and I think Dr. Flint shares enthusiasm for your question. We want to know if you have a story of resilience in your family's history or if you're a historian from your research. Uh, if you do have a story of resilience, we want you to send that brief story of no more than 200 words uh, as a message on Facebook to the Caroline Marshall Drawn Center for the Arts and Humanities, and we will post your story there. Uh, we will also, if you send us a story, contact you for your address, and we will send you a free Pebble Hill lapel pin. Dr. Flint, show them that Pebble Hill lapel pin that they can receive uh, if they will send us a story. Thank you. I have um, one on my desk at home. Excellent. And, uh, and, and you all can follow us here for announcements of future online programming. Uh, but Dr. Flint, uh, sort of in our final minute or two, uh, just as a citizen of Alabama, a community member, um, and a friend of all of the people who have been watching, uh, what message do you have for us as we face these uncertain days? Mark, um, every crisis in American history and every family crisis I've ever known anything about has been both a crisis in the sense that you didn't know what to do and an opportunity in the sense that you can learn what to do from that crisis that you can't learn any other way. Let me give you an example of this. When uh, my mother was in the last three months of her life and uh, I insisted that she move to uh, an assisted living in Auburn so I could go uh, be with her every day and uh, help uh, during those last uh, months. Uh, she was very resistant and uh, had taken care of herself all of her life and was uh, not going to come to Auburn under any circumstances. But finally, uh, uh, she just simply could not manage all the medicines and picking them up and so forth. So she came to Auburn. And uh, I had a wonderful opportunity to be with her virtually every day. And I, I thought, well, what, am, what are we going to talk about? <laughs> her life is so different from mine. And and I'm finishing my career at Auburn and I have doctoral students and what are we going to do when I go over there every day? And what I started doing was I took my tape recorder and of course think, think now smartphone. Uh, you can do the electronic technology so much simpler now. But I began to ask her questions. And Mark, it was as if the woman that I was learning about was not my mother. She was beginning, I, I said, uh, well, tell me about what it was like uh, when you were a little child. And uh, we had just had uh, the birth of a, of a grandson in the family. So she had held this beautiful little boy, uh, uh, Ambrose Doss Flint, in her arms. And all of a sudden, she's morphing back to be a little girl. And she's talking about how her mother had to hold her hand and they had to walk two miles from their, their house made out of rocks carried from Turkey Creek, folk architecture down to the bus stop so she could go to Hillman Hospital, which was the charity hospital in Birmingham, in order to have her scarlet fever uh, taken care of. And uh, this, this is a story she'd never told before. Well, over that three months, virtually every day I went, I got a new story. Now, if you think of the enforced isolation of the coronavirus virus, and the way in which it's going to force us, people like me, a widower, to be sitting there in the house all this time, what can you do? Well, you can do something that is entirely solitary. You can take a tape recorder and you begin to record your stories. And you realize the greatest gift you will ever give your children is not, in fact, your bank account, when you die, for heaven's sakes, but it's your stories, the family stories. So I would say everybody who feels, I don't know what to do because here I'm by myself or only my wife and I are here and we've already told all these stories to each other for 50 years, tell the stories for grandchildren. Take your telephone or however you record things or however you communicate on Facebook or Twitter or whatever you do, 
and turn from the stupid, irrelevant, insipid conversations that I am told <laughs> are constant on Facebook and Twitter and turn them into something life expanding, life changing about who you are, what you are, what made you the way you are. We never do that in American society because we're too torn in so many directions by the routine of our lives. Well, there ain't no routine left now. Therefore, the very solitude of the crisis is the greatest single advantage you will ever have to go off and reminisce inside yourself. Who you are, what made you the way you are, why the way you are is perfectly fine to you and a legacy that you would like for your children to inherit or more introspectively, who you are is not who you wish your children would be. And this is the reason why you wish your children wouldn't be this way. So in a sense, you will never have a greater opportunity for introspection, self-discovery, and communicating all that to your children through the generations than you will have right now. Folks, the professor has spoken and we all have homework to do now. And as many of his former students will attest, the guy doesn't grade easy. So get your stuff done and send us a story in uh, to Facebook so that we can post it. Uh, Dr. Flint, thank you. Thank you, Mark.